We've got just one last question for you here. It's from Arnold Slabicorn. I'm probably mispronouncing Arnold's last name. Uh, he's a senior director of analytics and data science, and he's curious on your viewpoint on how um, all these generative AI technologies, um, maybe AI technologies in general, but he specifically talks about LLMs um, and things like uh, AutoGPT, which you mentioned earlier. So um, at the time of recording, it was it's one of the highest trending projects in GitHub. And so he's wondering how these kinds of uh, tools are going to impact the labor market in the short term, so in the next couple of years, as well as beyond. So as I'm framing the answer to this question, I do want to reiterate that from a labor participation force and the productivity of humanity's output, we've never been more productive as a civilization, right? And when we look back at the last 30 plus years of why that has happened, it turns out it is technology and automation that has driven that level of productivity in, in society and human civilization. So this is clearly another moment where we're seeing a dislocation, all right? And that dislocation unquestionably is being driven by AI and automation. And so as we go through this dislocation, uh, there will be shifts in the labor force. And it's not that there isn't going to be incredible amounts of work for everyone to do over time. It's just what I view now is, you know, a great reskilling needs to also happen mm -hmm. through the midst of all this, mm -hmm. right? Because the things that humans were doing in their respective jobs prior may not exist any longer. Mm -hmm. And that's just because the reasoning, the inference, the ability for a generative model to be able to do things that a human could historically have only done is now possible with just the machine doing it itself. Mm -hmm. And I think you kind of go back to what I mentioned earlier in the podcast, which is over time, it is about human machine symbiosis. And so in every dislocation that has happened up to this moment, you've had a reimagination of what that human machine symbiosis is. This is a profound one, one that will have a fair degree of impact on what we think of as blue collar work, uh, white collar work, um, all work. At the end of the day, as we're going through that dislocation, one of the things that we have to just be very cognizant of is how do we ensure the reskilling of work at scale? And one of my um, incredible sort of passions about, about all of this um, over you know, my own career from this moment on is, is how do we ensure that there's meaningful work for everyone? And it's something that we have to deeply and profoundly engage in as a society because if we don't provide meaningful work, um, even as this dislocation is occurring, there's problematic issues with you know, the sort of core bedrock of, of, of human civilization. For sure. And, and that's where if we, if we undertake the necessary steps to reskill ourselves, in any job, your job, my job, like, like we have to do our jobs differently, right? It's like, you know, as, uh, as someone who is a builder of software, um, as someone who's a data scientist, someone who's an investor, it doesn't matter if all of those jobs can now be augmented differently with, with the possibility of a, uh, a, a very powerful, enabling tool like a transformer and the use of a transformer for you know the gpt cell models that have emerged mm -hmm. but that 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 means like just like all kinds of tools were introduced in our past in human civilization we have to make the adjustments as humans for the introduction of these new tools part of that is investing back in ourselves part of that is re-education reskilling retraining and re-enablement to properly work um, for this next decade and beyond. 
it will feel a little rough for a while. I have no doubt about it because in a lot of ways we haven't undertaken the rescaling of work. Yeah, uh, very well said. I agree with you on all those points. And I think an interesting uh, point to add is that in all of these automations that have happened historically, uh, unemployment has gone down. And it's interesting that in most Western countries, certainly I know in the US, we're at historic low unemployment at the same time that we have unprecedented levels of automation. And so it seems like these, uh, from uh, steam engines and uh, mechanization from, you know, ag from agricultural work where uh, 200 years ago, 99% of people were involved in just making enough food to live. Yeah. And now only a few percent of people in a Western country need to be concerned with creating food and now we have this reverse problem of for, for like more people are dying from too much food. Uh, you know, in orders of magnitude, more people are dying from having too much food and the diseases associated with that than of malnutrition and, um, you know, not having access to calories. That's going to be another podcast for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, yeah, all of these historical automation events have led to more opportunity and the kind of work that people get as a result is typically more enjoyable. I would cert I certainly love that I can be making podcast episodes with you instead of toiling in the fields mm -hmm. for 18 hours a day, hoping that I have enough wheat for next winter to survive on. Um, and so I think that this shift will be like those uh, where the, the more automatable parts of your job get automated or augmented and you can focus more on the enjoyable parts of it. And one of the things that you mentioned the, the type of work up to this point. Well, there's a, a type of work that we've introduced into our society, particularly in the last three to four decades, and it's computational work. And when we think about computational work today, when we interface with a machine prior, the level of interface was very low, right? The layer that we were interfacing was in assembly code perhaps, right? And then we introduced this notion of the compiler, right? And then we introduced higher level programming languages effectively on top of compilers. And so what I think is where the computational work of our you know, great civilization is headed is that we're going to be in a moment where the most common programming languages in the world are likely going to be English and Chinese. Right. And that doesn't necessarily close off the fact that there isn't incredibly compelling things to do, to your point. It just means that the abstraction that we can now engage, the democratization, the scale of what we can now use our machines to help us create better outcomes for ourselves and the rest of society is more possible now and into the future than ever before. And that's what excites me a lot about this, this movement towards generative AI. Yeah, yeah, very cool vision, which leads me to my last technical kind of question for you, which is you've been around for decades in the software industry, first as an operator, now as an investor, you've seen the tremendous change that you just outlined at a high level. Is there something, is there a vision of the future that you have that you're kind of hoping for as a society that we're leading towards? Yeah, uh, if if I look at you know what this should look like in the next decade and beyond, I I don't go back and perceive this sort of dystopian world where no one has an ability to do high functioning meaningful work in their day jobs. They don't have enough time to be able to spend with their their families, their friends. I see a, a world where there's more ability to do higher level capabilities um, in your work life, in your home life, without all the monotony and a lot of the, the road tasks that have been historically limiting us. And it actually goes back to a little bit of an experience that I had when I was president of Alteryx. And I remember at a user conference, uh, one of our first user conferences, and we, we'd done a fair amount of work 
in the product to be able to rebuild a self-service analytics capability that didn't exist at that moment for doing analytical data prep, data blending. And one of the data analysts that was at the conference in those early days came up to, came up to me and, and he had this sort of look of, of just joy, but, but also uh, emotion. And, and he, was, he was about to cry. And, and, and he said, can I give you a hug? And I'm like, I don't know you yet. <laughs> Why are you wanting to give me a hug? And, and, and he says, well, I just wanted to let you know that I was able to get to my son's baseball game on Fridays, again, on time. And it's been over two years that I've been able to do that because I've always had to stay after the time that I've been allocated for work to get the data set right, mm. to be able to be ready for the next week. Mm -hmm. And now I can run a routine, it's automated that routine, I'm home at 5.30 and I can make my son's baseball game. Wow, great story. And that is what I think about as the profound nature of AI and automation for this next generation. Like, what if we can all get to our kids' baseball games on time? What if we can all have a higher quality level of interaction with our friends and our families? Because the road tasks, the things that have gotten in the way of us being more higher, higher productivity and what we're engaging upon is somehow more possible than before because humans and machines are working in a more symbiotic way. And that's what excites me about this future, particularly when it comes to a generative AI first world.